in a struggle as old as time. There are two religions destined for a conflict. This conflict will be unlike anything ever seen. What will happen? Discover the Bible Prophecy. Islam and Christianity, a Bible Prophecy Seminar by Tim Rosenberg. This evening, we are on part six of Islam and Christianity and Bible Prophecy, Tidings from the East and the Mark of the Beast. Actually, this is related to the greatest evangelistic opportunity of all time. In our last presentation, we were looking at the third and final conflict between Islam and Christianity. For when the Roman Empire breaks up, you have Christian North, Islamic South, Jerusalem gets caught in the middle. And in Daniel 11, verses 40 to 43, it described how radical Islam would be overthrown, moderate Islam would follow papal-led Christianity, and there would be a group of Muslims and a group of Christians that would take a stand for Jesus Christ. And they together will be caught in the middle. And that's exactly where I want to be. But let's take a look at this wonderful evangelistic opportunity. We have up on the screen again our chart that shows the three conflicts. And we're currently in that third one. And, you know, the three things to expect, number one, where the king of the south would do something that would anger and cause the king of the north to call for war. And then radical Islam would be destroyed. And, well, 2014, the caliphate angered the pope. He called for military action against radical Islam. And now Trump says he's going to eradicate radical Islam from the face of the earth. So we're clicking right along in that. Once radical Islam goes down, you have a little gap between when it goes down and when the king of the north goes down. And it's during that gap we get the greatest evangelistic opportunity of all time. If you like sharing about Jesus Christ, you should be excited about this stuff. Because I love sharing about Jesus, and it's already getting easier for me as we get further and further into this thing. Now, we're looking at Daniel 11, 44 and 45 tonight. Uh, these are the last moments of the King of the North, or Papal Alliance, and it comes to its end at the end of verse 45. Here's what it says. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. The him is the king of the north. And the leader of Christianity through all this time period, the generic leader, so to speak, has been the papacy. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. So what is news from the east? Well, in Ezekiel, a contemporary of Daniel, we find some information on that. Chapter 43. Afterwards, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces towards the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. So, its glory is coming from the east, and it makes the earth shine with glory, all right? And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. No more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name, they nor their kings by their harlotry. Did you just notice God said he's going to place his throne at Jerusalem? Do you realize if God says he's going to place his throne in Jerusalem, that just put a bullseye on Jerusalem. No wonder Radical Islam wants to set up the caliphate in Al-Quds or Jerusalem. Israel wants it. Christianity wants it. Yeah, Everything's looking at it. But God sets his capital up there at the end of the millennium, according to Revelation. But he will do it. They defiled my holy name by the abominations which they committed. Therefore, I have consumed them in my anger. Now let them put their harlotry and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in their midst forever. The direction of the sealing angel in Daniel 7 comes from the east as well. 
Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. I've often wondered what keeps terrorism from having even more chaotic impact on the world. And the only explanation I can come up with, God's holding it in check to some degree still. The direction of Jesus' return is also from the east. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So, in Revelation 18, we find the earth filled with light and glory, just like Ezekiel. A final powerful warning given to the world. I, I think that Revelation 18 is just, it's talking about this greatest evangelistic opportunity of all time. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having a great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory, just like Ezekiel says. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great, has fallen, has fallen, and has become the dwelling of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her. And so we have papal-led Christianity, and it has fornication and all the rest of it, and there's more and more of that problem happening. Everything is lining up. So just before the destruction of the king of the north, God sends a warning message to get away from it and all of its abominations. Now, if you were God and you had a whole lot of people in papal-led Christianity, and it's just not Catholics that are following the Pope in many ways. If you had a lot of your people that were following and you're about to destroy papal-led Christianity, those that are following it, would you want to give a final warning or not? Yeah. And that's exactly what God's doing. Let's take a look at the message from the north. It's Ezekiel 44, the next chapter in Ezekiel. Also, he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple. So I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Again, we have God's glory. Fabulous message going to the world idea here. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell on my face, and the Lord said to me, Son of man, mark well, see with your eyes and hear with your ears all that I say to you concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord and all its laws. Mark well who may enter the house and all who go out from the sanctuary. Now say to the rebellious, to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, O house of Israel, let us have no more of all your abominations. So God is interested in us getting rid of abominations, which are false teachings, and coming back to Bible truth. And I told you at the end of presentation five that Daniel seems to take a turn at the end of the fall of the king of the south. It's been talking a lot about geopolitical stuff. There's always a religious, spiritual application. But as soon as the king of the south goes down, all of a sudden, it's primarily spiritual religious as it points out how papal-led Christianity has veered from God in the teachings that it gives the world and that the world is following. And so my challenge for you is, you need to listen to these presentations from here on out in particular and find out what really is the Bible telling you and you need to make sure you're following the Bible. Not me, not some other pastor, not some church. There is no church on this planet that saves one person. Only Jesus does. He's the only Savior that we have. And you've got to make sure you're following Jesus and his word, the Bible. Well, Ezekiel 44 is a judgment or warning against abominations. Now let's take a look at something. And, it, and that is, we have a message from the east and a message from the north that gets the king of the north mad. Take a look at something. Edom, Moab, and Ammon are which direction from Jerusalem? They're to the east. And we talked about in our last presentation that we're going to have a group of Muslims that take a stand for Jesus and the Bible. 
And so they'd be telling papal-led Christianity, no, we're not going to follow traditions in your teachings. We're going to follow the teachings of Jesus in the Bible. And that'll get him mad. But Revelation 18 says, come out of her, my people. God has a people in papal-led Christianity, the king of the north. And if he's pulling his people out of the king of the north, they would be giving the same message. We're going to follow Jesus in the Bible, and they would be symbolized here as coming from the north because they're a remnant out of the king of the north. So God's got a remnant, a group, that he's pulling out of Islam and Christianity. One's represented as east on the map of Daniel 11, the other from the north. And together, they share the message that Jesus is the Savior and he's coming again. You see, if radical Islam is gone, who can stop the spread of Christianity in the Middle East in the 1040 window? Mod radical Islam's gone. Moderate Islam's pretending to be Christian. For a short time, there will be nobody to stop the spread of real Christianity. And Christians... True Christians, followers of Jesus, will have an open door to share the gospel like never before. But then the king of the north gets mad and he comes in and tries to slam the door shut. Friends, we've got to be ready to roll at the end of this third conflict, sharing Jesus with the world around us. It says, but news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. Look at Revelation's parallel statement here. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. If I was the devil, I would know my time is about up when the whirlwind of Daniel 11 begins to happen. So I think he's already really starting to get upset with great wrath. Have you noticed the world's going crazy in morals and everything else? Uh-huh. Expect it. Expect it to get a lot worse. And expect to get caught in the middle over and over again. Now, I want to share with you Revelation 13, 11 and 17. In Daniel 11, the king of the north goes out to destroy and annihilate, and that's God's people that he's after. Those that are standing for Jesus Christ. Look at the parallel in Revelation 13. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Well, the way I see things, annihilate and kill, they're about the same thing. Suppose you were taken captive by a terrorist. And he said, I'm going to give you a choice. Would you rather be killed or annihilated? You don't like my options, huh? Because it's the same. Daniel and Revelation are right before the coming of Jesus. They're talking about the same thing here. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Hey, if somebody took away your ability to buy and sell, they took away your checking account, your savings account, your credit cards, and all the rest of that stuff, would you think they were trying to destroy you? Yeah. Yeah. Notice the parallel between Daniel and Revelation. So when you see the king of the north goes out to destroy and annihilate God's people, it's the same as the mark of the beast stuff right before God's kingdom is finally established in Revelation. You see, everybody has to make a choice. You're either going to have the seal of God or the mark of the beast. Now, a lot of people are worried about the mark of the beast, but really what you need to be doing is focusing on the seal of God because then you won't get the mark of the beast. All right? Because you're going to get one or the other. Let's take a look at some things. There's a warning that you don't want to receive the mark of the beast. Here it is in Revelation chapter 14. Then the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. My artist came up with this one. And we don't know what the seal of God might look like. We do have the mark of the beast here is 666. Um, that would hurt if it was a brand. People are always talking about what is the mark of the beast. Some people say, oh, it's a tattoo. Um, I, some people were saying it was barcodes. There was a book on how barcodes were the mark of the beast. And then I noticed at the Christian bookstore, there was a barcode as a price tag on the mark of the beast book. <laughs> I found that hilarious. And there's just all kinds of stuff. 
Now, let's just suppose it was a tattoo for a bit. If they drugged me and put a tattoo of 666 on my forehead, would God go by the tattoo or by my heart? He'd go by my heart, wouldn't he? So here's what I really believe the mark of the beast and the seal of God are. Notice the mark of the beast can be received either on the forehead or the hand. You can believe that the beast is right, the king of the north system, and follow it, or because it's so powerful, you don't believe it's right, but you don't want to get it mad at you, so you go along with it. You follow the crowd with your actions. Either you believe it or you just go along with it. God's people get the seal of God on their foreheads, not on the hand. What does that mean? You've got to make a decision for Jesus on your own. You can't follow anybody else into God's kingdom. You've got to make that decision for yourself. And then you can't pretend to be something you're not. You've got to stand for Jesus Christ. Everybody has a choice. They choose one or the other. Now, not everybody's going to like what I find when I take a look at what I find is the choice between God's side and the counterfeit side. But we live in a free country, right? At least when I'm in the U.S., I get to say that. My goal, again, is to drive people to Jesus and Bible study. So my hope is that when I go through this one, you're going to take the notes down, you're going to go back to Scripture, and because you love Jesus and you're listening to the Holy Spirit, you're going to follow Jesus and his word, the Bible. Ultimately, it's your guide, right? So let's go. Let me show you what I find. Ezekiel 20:12. What does God say his sign or mark is? Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So he says the Sabbath was a sign that we are his. It goes on to say, and he is ours, because this is actually verse 12 through 20 in the context. And it's a sign that God sanctifies us. Sanctifying something means to make it holy. Can I make myself holy? No. Can God make me holy? Yes. So it's a sign that God makes us holy. All right, here's another one. Exodus 31, 13. Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Over and over again, I find this idea that the Sabbath is a sign of what God does to make me holy. In other words, it's a sign of righteousness by faith. Now, a seal... In ancient times, they'd have these signet rings and they'd press it into wax or clay and it would put an impression in there and it'd give a person's name, their title, and territory. Let's take a look at God's covenant, his commandments. Exodus 20, verses 8. Where, is, where does it give his sign or, or title, name, territory? Na Let's see. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. There's your name, title, combination. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. What's his territory? Everything. If you can find it, he made it. To the down into the tiniest microscope views to the greatest telescopic views. God made it all. If you find it, it's his. But notice, he created the Sabbath. He took the seventh day, created the earth in six days, took the seventh day and made it holy. He hallowed it. Get this, he took an ordinary 24-hour period and made it holy as a symbol that he can take an ordinary person, sinner like you and me, and make us holy. When God says something's holy, it is holy. That's my only hope of ever being holy, friends, and yours too. Revelation 12, 17. It said Satan gets mad and goes after people. Well, let's take a look at who he goes after when he goes out with great rage. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. That would be Christians. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. These would be true Christians, those that are actually standing up for Jesus Christ, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. They're trusting in Jesus, but they're letting the Holy Spirit change him from the inside out to keep what he said. 
That really gets Satan mad if you do that. Bible says so. Can't be wrong then, can it? Revelation 14, 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We keep getting this idea that God's end time people are trusting in Jesus, but they're also keeping his commandments and Satan's not pleased. Revelation 14, 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven, the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Oh, right at the end, a message that goes to the world is quotes from the fourth commandment, that territory of God's. And so when we're keeping the commandments, Revelation 14 talked about it, it quotes from that fourth one. Some people said, yeah, but keeping God's commandments, that, that would not be so great, really. Look at what it says in 1 John chapter 5. This is love for God, to obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. I don't think it's a burden to keep God's commandments. I think it's a burden when I don't. I mean, think about it. If I steal, now I've got to hide from the police. If I lie, oh, now I've got to remember what I told the who. I don't like doing that. It's hard enough just to remember the truth to start out with. So just stick to the same true story, and you're fine. By the way, I've been interrogated after a crime before. I had a church that was burned to the ground by an arsonist with a huge for sale sign out front of it. Put me number one on the list of suspects. I spent hours with two guys in a little room in a bare light. And you know what you do when you're in those positions? You make sure you tell the truth first time by and even if it's embarrassing, you tell the truth because if they find that you're not telling the truth somewhere, boy, they're going to come in on you. And I just made sure I told the truth all the way through. They didn't have anything they could get. Boy, that comes out a lot better at the end of the day. Make sure you're always telling the truth. It's not burdensome when you follow God's law. Well, was the Sabbath ever changed? Because, hey, most people don't keep it anymore. Well, what I can tell you is the Bible doesn't ever change it. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at the New Testament church. And we find more about the Sabbath in the writings of Luke, a Gentile educated physician. If anybody should have talked about the change of the Sabbath from a Jewish day of worship to a Christian day of worship, then it should have been Dr. Luke. But he talks more about the Sabbath than anyone else. Let's take a look at it. Acts and he wrote that one. And we're also going to look in Luke 2. Acts 13, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Did you catch that? At the end of the first Sabbath, Jews and Gentiles are there, and the Gentiles say, hey, we want you to preach this to us next week, next Sabbath. And Paul and Luke don't say, hey, tell you what, you're Gentiles. The day of worship for Gentiles is the first day of the week, so come back tomorrow and we'll do that. No. They invited them back next Sabbath, and next Sabbath they did it with Jew and Gentiles. Lots more Gentiles than Jews. Acts 18, another city. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. So we have Jews and Gentiles together in the synagogue. How long was he there, verse 11? And he continued there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So for a year and a half, every Sabbath, he was in preaching. That's a lot of Sabbaths in a row in the New Testament. That's 70 some Sabbaths, year and a half. And in the future, the Bible says the Sabbath is still there, like in the new heavens and the new earth. Isaiah 66. For as new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Hmm. So not only was it in the Old Testament, the New Testament church did this, and it says, way down the line in the new heavens and new earth it's still going to be there well is saturday still the biblical seventh day because hey maybe the calendar's all messed up and maybe uh the biblical seventh day is wednesday how do i know what day it is dr luke again he makes it really clear here we go we're going to look at the last part of luke 23 and the first part of luke 24 this man, Joseph of Arimathea, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. 
and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandments. Okay, according to Dr. Luke, who's writing well after Jesus' death and resurrection, he's saying that they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandments right after Jesus died. Okay, now Luke 24. Next verse. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing spices which they'd prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And praise the Lord, the stone was gone because Jesus was gone. He'd proved he'd had victory over sin and death. And what a wonderful blessing the resurrection has been for all of us. Well, now let's take a careful look at something. Jesus died on what was called the preparation day. And that happened to be the day before the Sabbath. We call it what? Good Friday now. Although that wasn't such a good day. The names that we put on things, folks. <clears throat> anyway, the very next day it said they rested according to the Sabbath, a commandment on the Sabbath. And then on the first day of the week, which is often called Easter Sunday, and I prefer Resurrection Sunday, um, was the next day. So we have three days, a weekend, mentioned in Luke. And if you want to figure out where the biblical Sabbath day is, all you have to really do is figure out what day comes between Friday and Sunday. That's not too difficult, is it? Now, it gets even more interesting because the word, the word Sabbath, the Sabbath well, tell me, what's the name for Saturday in Spanish? Sabado. That is a variant of the word Sabbath. In about half the languages on this planet, the word for the seventh day of the week is a form of the word Sabbath. It doesn't happen on any other day of the week. Sabbath, linguistically, is there on the seventh day, what we call Saturday. Also, first day of the week. In Greek, it doesn't say first day of the week. It's first from the Sabbath. The second day is second from the Sabbath, third from the Sabbath, fourth from the Sabbath, fifth from the Sabbath, preparation for the Sabbath, Sabbath. Every time you find the number of a day of the week in the New Testament, it's telling you its relationship to the seventh day Sabbath. It just doesn't show up in our English translations. But check it in Greek. It's there. And so we have all these indicators here. It's amazing. Here's what Dr. Luther, Martin Luther said. For he, Jesus, died at about two o'clock on Friday and consequently was dead for about two hours on the first day. After that night, he lay in the grave all day, which is the true Sabbath. On the third day, meaning Sunday, which we commemorate now, he rose from the dead. That bo bothered Melanchthon and some of Martin Luther's followers so badly that some of them became Sabbath keepers. What's the meaning of the Sabbath in the New Testament? Same thing as the Old Testament. Surprise, surprise. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Oh, that's right back to creation, right? But it's the seventh day he rests. Keep going. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. You see, when you keep the Sabbath, you're not trusting in works. You're resting from works. Your works, the wages of sin, is what? Death. But the Sabbath is a sign that God makes us holy. So I rest from my works by not working. Oh, that's an interesting parallel, isn't it? So God's metaphor is we rest from our works by not working on the seventh-day Sabbath and we trust in his works, not ours. The Sabbath is still a sign of righteousness by faith. And you will be told all over the world, if you try and follow the biblical seventh day, you're trying to earn your way into heaven. That doesn't work, friends. But I'm never going to disobey my way into heaven. You see, the wages of sin is death. I can earn death, but I can never earn life. That's a gift of Jesus Christ. And I earn death by being in rebellion. I choose to follow Jesus wherever he leads. Somebody says, well, God's law has been abolished. Really? Paul didn't think so. Do we then make void the law through faith? 
Certainly not. On the contrary, we established the law. I can never be good enough to be saved. But when Jesus cleanses me from sin and sends the Holy Spirit inside to change me from the inside out, then it works. It never works when I do it on my own. But it's faith that makes it possible. It establishes God's law in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have two sides, God's side and the B side. Let's actually take a look at what the B side, papal-led Christianity, claims for its sign of authority. Remember on the second presentation, the eighth characteristic it mentioned that it changes times and laws. In Daniel 11, 28, 30, and 32, it said it would fight against the covenant. And yes, it did attack God's covenant, and it attacked God's word. It actually made it illegal to use it for centuries. Daniel 7, 25 Again, this is the little horn or papal-led Christianity, and he shall intend to change times and laws. Okay, does the papacy in history claim to have done that? Here we have so great of authority and, so po and power that he can modify, change, or interpret even divine law. The Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God, and he acts as vicegerent of God upon earth with most ample power of binding and loosing his sheep. Converts Catechism again. Take a look at how they prove they have power over God's law. Question, which day is the Sabbath? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. And that is not a good enough reason for me. I've got to have it from Scripture because I want to follow Jesus and his word. St. Catherine's Church, Sentinel, newsletter, Algonac, Michigan is where this church is. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. The day of the Lord was chosen not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. The day of resurrection, the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, came on the first day of the week. So this would be the new Sabbath. Did you notice they didn't claim any biblical authority for it? They just did it. Now, the rest of this quote isn't completely accurate. All right? It's close, but not completely accurate. You'll, you'll see with a smile when we get there. People who think that the scripture should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventist and keep Saturday holy. Here's what's not accurate about that. There are Messianic Christians. There are Adventists. There are Seventh-day Baptists, Assemblies of God Seventh-day. There's all kinds of Sabbath-keeping Christians. Why did he put Adventists in there? Because they happen to be the largest at about 20 million. But we're not the only ones by any stretch of the imagination. There's lots of them all over the place. Look at this book, Roman Catholic document, The Faith of Millions by John O'Brien. But since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Yes, of course, it's inconsistent, but the change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born. They've continued to observe custom even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. I have found many, many places where Catholic authors poke fun at Protestants for following the Catholic Church on the day of worship and not the Bible. That observance remains the reminder of the mother church from which, which non-Catholic sects broke away. And the Catholics consider themselves the mother church. And those that are keeping it, the worshiping on the first day of the week, they're considering their separated daughter churches. That gets really interesting when we read in Revelation a little later. Here's what Wikipedia said back in 2012. Until the second and third century, most Christian groups kept the Jewish Sabbath. Nowhere in the Bible does it call it Jewish Sabbath, but that's what they put in there. With the practice of Sunday observance emerging after the Jewish-Roman wars. Keep those Jewish-Roman wars in mind. We're coming back to it. The Catholic Church's general repudiation of Jewish practices during this period is apparent in the Council of Laodicea, 4th century AD, where Canon 29 of the Laodicean Council specifically refers to the Sabbath. Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day, and if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema or excommunicated from Christ. Whoa, 
What an interesting statement. I follow the Bible and I get excommunicated and I'm told I'm going to go to hell. I follow the church and they tell me they're going to take me to heaven. But a church doesn't save anybody. Jesus does. That's why I'm so determined to follow the Bible and not the traditions of any church. The real Jesus, U.S. News and World Report. Fourth century Gentile Christians, writes Fredrickson, despite the anti-Jewish ideology of their own bishops, kept Saturday as their day of rest. Under his Constantine regime, Sunday became the Christian Sabbath. Now, I want to mention something here. Back to those Jewish-Roman wars. How did the change really happen? It started before Constantine. You see, originally, Christianity was considered a part of Judaism. And Jesus was a Jewish carpenter, right? His disciples were Jewish guys. And there was no New Testament for many years. All anybody had was the Old Testament. That's interesting. The Bible of the New Testament church was the Old Testament for many years. And so they have the same holy book, they're worshiping on the same day, and they're following a Jewish guy. And so they're considered Jewish, which was good because Jews had special religious liberties for a while. They didn't have to burn incense to the Caesar, which was considered an act of worship. And so Christians could get away with some stuff. But then the Jews revolt. That was really bad because now, well, Jerusalem is destroyed during the Jewish-Roman Wars. And now the Jews are really obnoxious to the Romans and the Romans say, forget those special religious liberties, now you have penalties. If you're Jewish, you can't be in Jerusalem, Rome, or any provincial capital. You see, Christians were arguing about who's the greatest. We had churches over, down in North Africa, Rome, other places, and they're trying to see who's the most important. And hey, if I'm considered Jewish, I have to leave these important cities, provincial capitals. And so Alexandrian Rome bishops in particular didn't want to do that. And so they said, we'll change the day of worship. We're not Jews. We worship on a different day. And that was a major impetus in the change. Before that, some had been worshiping on both. Now they were just going this way. But notice what we just saw in that U.S. News and World Report, that the average people wanted to keep keeping Sabbath. It was their leaders that were pushing Sunday. Now, remember we had Islam attacking papal-led Christianity and then the papal-led Christianity with the U.S. conquer Islam and then that leaves the papacy in the U.S. in control and I'm suggesting that Sunday worship would be the sign of allegiance to Christianity. It was way back at the beginning. It would become that again. Now, you don't have to just guess on that. Would the papacy really try and enforce Sunday keeping on the world today? Take a look at this document. It's the Catechism of the Catholic Church put together by a guy by the name of Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. Do you know who Cardinal Ratzinger, changed, what did he change his name to? Pope Benedict. This has a lot of authority in the Catholic Church, folks. All right? You can get them in Bards and Nobles and other places. Um, when Pope Benedict became the Pope, I went and bought mine because I'd already looked at it there, but once he became Pope, I thought, hey, I'm going to have one of those. Look what it says. In respecting religious liberty and the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sunday and the church's holy days as legal holidays. Respecting religious liberty. In other words, the only people who have religious liberty are those following the church. What happens to a Jewish person who wants to worship on the seventh-day Sabbath? They're now a lawbreaker. What happens to a Muslim who wants to worship on Friday? They're out of step too with the law. What happens to a Christian who wants to be a Sabbath-keeping Christian? They're out of line with the law. That's what they did starting from the time of Constantine following. They've done it in the past and Pope Benedict put it in print that they want to do it again. This is in full harmony with what the Bible prophecy says. And then, in 2010, we had the Catholic Bishops' Council try to put Sunday, work-free Sunday laws through in the European Union. Why would they be interested in making Sunday a day of worship? Because the churches are empty on Sunday and the mosques are full on Friday. 
and it's getting worse. And so what do you do? You pass a law to try and force people to do what you want. That doesn't work. Revival comes from the heart, not from the outside. It's got to be love for Jesus and keeping his commandments, not because the government said so. It has to be based on Jesus. Jesus said it this way, and in vain they worship me teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. It never works to follow commandments of people. You've got to be trusting in Jesus and following him. So is this just a Seventh-day Adventist thing? Well, the real question is, is it from the Bible? Where did this teaching come from? That at the end, that the day of worship could be a test. Are we following God's word or papal-led Christianity and their word? Well, it's sure not from a Seventh-day Adventist. All right? There were no Seventh-day Adventists in 1657. Seventh-day Adventists came about 200 years later. Take a look at this book. A friend of mine found this in the Notre Dame archives, Roman Catholic University. They keep this stuff. The seventh-day Sabbath sought out and celebrated or the saints' last design upon the man of sin with their advance of God's first institution to its primitive perfection being a clear discovery of the black character of the head of the little horn, Daniel 7.25, the change of times and laws. With the Christian's glorious conquest over the mark of the beast and the recovery of the long-slighted seventh day to its ancient glory, wherein Mr. Aspinwall may receive full answer to his late peace against the Sabbath. Thomas Tillam, Minister of the Gospel. If you want to read that one, you can go on my website and read it. If you want to buy one, read it and then give me the copy. Last I was aware of one, I did hear of one for sale for $18,000. Maybe that PDF copy on my website just got more interesting. Uh, so anyway, but take a close look at the print. He's making a picture with the print. You have a cup, a goblet, with a saucer under it. And over it, where it says the Seventh-day Sabbath, you just have some kind of orb up there. But directly under the word or, you have the goblet. Change of times and laws is the bottom of the goblet. And then you have the little saucer. That's an interesting picture. Remember the Vatican coin? You have a lady with a goblet? Revelation 17 says there's a lady with a goblet full of abominations false teachings that aren't according to Scripture. And what is over coming out of the top of the goblet? Sunburst. What was it in Constantine's day that he added to the, with the cross? The worship of the sun. And what day did the church choose to replace the seventh-day Sabbath? The day of the sun. It's amazing the stuff that's in here. It's hidden right in front of everybody's faces. But because of tradition, nobody thinks about what they're looking at. So I find that the Sabbath ends up being a test of love and loyalty. I'll get to that a little more. But look what Jesus, how Jesus said it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. If you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say if you love them, break them, did he? The Holy Spirit is supposed to change us from the insight and bring us in the harmony with God's word. The Holy Spirit is also called God's sign or seal. But look, it's linked with keeping the commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will give you the spirit. That gives you the power to actually do what God says. And it's all based because you love him, because of Jesus Christ. It goes on to say, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The beast has a counterfeit spirit and a counterfeit day that go contrary to God and his word. Acts 17, verse 30, talks about what about people who don't know about the Bible Sabbath. It says, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he's ordained. He's given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Good news. God overlooks our ignorance. 
Aren't you glad? And in context, in Acts 17, he was overlooking people who were worshiping idols that didn't know better, breaking his commandments. Man, am I ever happy about that. Here's why. Could you guarantee me that you are in 100% perfect understanding of all God's truths from Scripture? You've learned everything there ever will be to know. Well, if it was based on us having everything accurate, we would have to know everything and make sure we're doing it accurately before we could have any confidence of our relationship with Jesus Christ. But our relationship isn't based on doing everything correctly. Our relationship is based on trusting Jesus Christ with what we do know. He overlooks what we don't know. If you have a little child and they don't know things, do you hold them accountable for what they don't know? Or do you just want to pick them up and get the big hug because that little child loves you? You see, if you love Jesus, he sends the Holy Spirit and as it's time, he reveals new things. Here's how I'm positive. I don't know it all yet. As I'm reading my Bible, I keep having this experience. Duh, why didn't I ever see that before? You understand that one? You've been there? I hope so. Because every time I have one of those, I now have a choice. Will I still surrender to God and do what he just showed me or will I do it my way or follow somebody else's way? You see, I have this ongoing opportunity. Will I really trust Jesus Christ or not? Well, let me tell you a story. A friend of mine, um, awesome pastor, not such a good speaker, but an awesome pastor. Some guys are wonderful speakers, but not such a good pastor on one-on-one. -on -one. This guy, fabulous on the one-on-one. -on -one. He started his ministry as a Presbyterian. He discovers the Sabbath and gets himself in all kinds of trouble and gets kicked out of the church because he was trying to follow the Bible. It doesn't take much to get kicked out of churches sometimes. Churches are really very traditional. Different traditions, different churches. It's kind of why I enjoy speaking in other churches because I don't know what the traditions are and I can watch the fireworks go off every once in a while when I accidentally stepped on one of their landmines. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so this guy becomes a Sabbath-keeping Christian. Then... He's really good at one-on-one, -on -one, and he starts being connected with other pastors that are finding the Bible Sabbath. And at one point when I talked to him, he'd helped somewhere over 60 pastors make the transition. It's really rough. But he was telling me one of those stories, and it was just really priceless. Here's how it went. There's a guy on his way home from church on Sunday. And as he's driving through the neighborhood, he sees somebody in his neighborhood taking shingles off of a house and starting to put more shingles on. I don't know if you've ever done it, but that's hard, hot work. And so he pulls over. It's Sunday. And he gets out of his car and he walks over and he says, Brother, don't you know you're not supposed to be working on the Lord's Day? And the guy on the roof looks down. And he says, Really? I'm not supposed to be work working the day? How do you know that? And the guy on the the pastor says, well, it says in the Bible you're not supposed to be working on the Lord's Day. He said, I believe the Bible, so if you can show me, he said, I'll stop working right now. Pastor goes out to his car, grabs his Bible, flips open the Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, the Sabbath commandment, to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. You nor your son nor your daughter, and on down the line, not to be working. And the he gets finished with it. He looks up at the guy. He says, see, it says not to be working. He said, the guy in the roof says, it does say that, doesn't it? The pastor says, yeah, it does. He says, could you read that to me again? I just want to make sure. And as the pastor's reading back through it, the guy in the roof says, whoa, whoa, stop. Didn't that just say seventh day? Wasn't that yesterday? And the pastor looks at it. And the pastor does what any good pastor would have done. He looks at the verses around it, a page or two either way, because if you're right, the context is going to save you. If you're wrong, you're on your own. He couldn't find anything in context. He looks up at the guy on the roof. He says, it does say seventh day, doesn't it? 
The pastor had always known where the verse was, but he'd never seen it. There's a big difference between reading it and understanding it, right? One of those, duh, why didn't I ever see that before moments? I've had many of them, so I'm not blaming this guy for having one. I mean, he's him a real good person. The guy on the roof scrambles down the ladder. He says, you know what? I'm actually a Sabbath-keeping Christian. I knew this. I just wanted to play along and see where it was going to go. He says, let's go in the house. I want to share a bunch of other verses. And they both have their Bibles and they study it. And by the time they're done with the study, the pastor has made his decision. He'd always been trusting in Jesus Christ and the Bible and he's not going to change now. He's going to follow the Bible and do what it says. And he switches the day he worships on. He's no more saved before or after. The Sabbath doesn't save you. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ that saves you. He had always been trusting in Jesus Christ. Trusting in Jesus Christ means trusting in Jesus Christ with assurance of salvation. But when you find something new, would it be healthy to say, hey, Jesus, I see what you're asking me to do in the Bible and I'm not doing it. Whoa, that would be rebellion. There's a big difference there, right? Yeah. If I have a little child that knocks over a vase and breaks it or priceless heirloom, well, it's not the little child that's a year old that's just learning the walk that's at fault. I shouldn't have had it there. But if I have my 18-year-old son picks up the priceless vase and I said, please put it down, and he goes, oh, wham, there, I put it down. You treat that any differently? Ignorant versus rebellious? Oh, yeah. God sees it differently. This is love for God to obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Hey, you know, having 52 extra days of vacation is not a burden. 24 hours every week, sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, a day to rest from your labor to remember that your works don't save you, only the works of Jesus save you. A day to spend in time with fellowship, exploring God's creation, his word, and helping other people. Not a day for self and your works, a day for what God wants and does. It brings rhythm and joy to life. You ought to try it. It really works. Now, back to Daniel 11 and the Islam-Christian conflict. We have the king of the north and the king of the south. The day of worship is included. Watch this. What is the Sabbath of Israel in Jerusalem? The seventh-day Sabbath. But it's not just for Old Testament Israel, Jewish people. The new covenant is that God will write his law in our hearts and in our minds, Jeremiah 31, and it's with the house of Israel. We become Israelites when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's why Ephesians 2 calls us citizens of the commonwealth of Israel when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so if we're truly an Israelite, a citizen of the Davidic King Jesus' kingdom, the day of worship should be the seventh-day Sabbath. But because the king of the north didn't want to be called Jewish or Israelite, he changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. And because the king of the south didn't want to be called Jewish or Israelite, he changed the day from Sabbath to Friday. Hey, where did God's Sabbath-keeping people just get caught? It's geopolitical and spiritual. Wow. It's all there. And what happens if you keep the Bible Sabbath? Oh, you're out of step with society. Papal-led Christianity. You're out of step with Islam. And you're in the middle, friends. You want a little idea what it's like? Go back and check Jewish history. You want to know what it's like? Look what happened during the Reformation to those reformers that found the Bible Sabbath. They often got killed by both sides. Yeah. Right now we've got religious liberty. But I'll tell you what, that's likely to be taken away. One more amazing piece here. There is one part of the Bible that Jews, Christians, and Muslims all agree was written by the finger of God. All three agree on this. That one part of the Bible 
actually written by the finger of God is the Ten Commandments. And of those ten, only one of them says remember. And the one God put remember in front of is the one that papal-led Christianity and Islam choose to forget. Isn't that amazing? God's people get caught in the middle. And when we are watching radical Islam going down, it should be a reminder that it is time to be digging into what the Bible says. We need to follow the Bible. Look what it says about Jesus. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read and was teaching them on the Sabbath. As a Christian, I should be following the example of Jesus or the papal, papal system. Jesus. Paul followed the example of Jesus. Seems like we should too. Hebrews tells it to us this way. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, I didn't share this to get you ticked off at me. I am hoping to stir you up to love and good works. I want you to go check the word for yourself. I'm not your judge. You're not my judge. Jesus is our judge. And thankfully, he overlooks our ignorance. But it didn't say he overlooked willful, willful disobedience, did he? Um, we need a fellowship, friends. But it needs to be a biblical fellowship. You know, if you're at a campfire and you take the coals of a fire and spread them out, they go out quite quickly. You keep them together, and they stay hot and warm. We need each other to stay warm for Jesus Christ. When I start to go cold, you can warm me up. When you go cold, I can help warm you up, and we can help each other. It's really, really important. Revelation 18 says it this way, right at the end. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. When it comes right down to it, we're going to have to be ready to come out of something. Come out of a system that claims to be Christian but is not truly following. These abominations of desolation. Here's the first one. They change God's law. And in the rest of this presentation, the text hits one after another of the statements or teachings of the system that are contrary to Scripture. I hope you can be there. And our next one, when Michael stands up,